Hello everyone and welcome to Tech Fix Flicks. In this tutorial, we will install and use Macrium Reflect 7 Free Edition, backup software for Windows 10. Coming up, we run through the installation procedure and take an overview of the key features of the Free Edition. Next, we look at two common backup types. Initially, we image a full system drive, then extract individual files from that image. After that, we'll clone a full drive to transfer a working operating system to a different or larger drive. We won't be using Macrium to back up collections of individual folders. For that, we prefer Syncback, which you can learn about in our Syncback free tutorial. We begin by running through the installation, and we launch our browser, in this case Google Chrome, and we navigate to the download page for the free edition, at the address on screen now, and in the written description accompanying this video. There are four commercial versions available, but as we like to use free software wherever possible, we will purely be using free tools in this tutorial. We click the Home Use button, which prompts the appearance of this dialog, inviting us to register the product. However, this step is optional, and we prefer to retain our privacy, so we simply click Continue to proceed, without entering any details. The initial download phase is brief, with a 5MB installer initially downloaded. There will be a further download, whose size will vary with component installation. Once complete, we click the upward pointing arrow in Google Chrome, which generates a menu from which we select the option to open. This opens the download agent, from which a number of configuration options are available. For ease of reference, we close the browser window in the background to concentrate purely upon the download agent. We can happily leave the edition selection untouched, as the free edition is the only selectable option here, short of entering a license key. We also accept the default download location, which will place the installer in our downloads folder. Clicking options enables us to select the 32 or 64 bit version, and if you need help identifying which version is appropriate for you, this is covered in our Windows 10 pre-installation steps tutorial, linked in the written description accompanying this video. We can also select the download option. For the purpose of this introductory tutorial, we will select Reflect Installer only, but the creation of rescue disks is also important for systems which are no longer able to boot into Windows, and is something which we will cover in a future tutorial. For now, with the defaults accepted, we click OK in the Download Options window before clicking Download in the main Download Agent window. The second download phase commences, with a progress bar scrolling from left to right to indicate the status of the download. In a typical setup, user account control interjects, and because we clearly prompted its appearance, we click Yes to proceed. Once the download has completed, an introductory installer screen appears, at which we simply click Next to advance. The introductory screen of the setup wizard then appears, at which we again click Next. As is traditional, acceptance of the license terms is mandatory in order to proceed, and we therefore click the relevant radio button to indicate our consent, before clicking Next to advance. The license key is automatically assigned, and we simply click the radio button to indicate that we intend to use the product in a home environment as opposed to a commercial one. Having made that selection, it's once again next to progress. For the second time, we are encouraged to provide our contact details, and for the second time, we retain our privacy by unticking the box to register, before again clicking next. We can further customise our installation options, but for this basic feature overview, we choose simply to accept the defaults. We do, however, choose to customise the installation location by clicking the Browse button and browsing to a customised installation location of our choosing. Regular viewers will be aware that we like to keep an organised installation directory, but novice users can simply skip this step and accept the default installation path. With a custom installation path selected, we once again click Next, where we reach the final pre-installation screen. Clicking Install commences the installation. The installation commences, with a progress bar moving from left to right as the process advances. As per our installation choices, a shortcut icon is added to our desktop, and we are advised that the installation has successfully concluded. Clicking Finish launches the program. We immediately see the main window, and note that there are three main backup tasks listed in the leftmost column, namely image selected disks on this computer, create an image of the partitions required to backup and restore Windows, and create a file and folder backup. We will address each of these in turn. Image selected disks enables us to backup one or more source drives to a destination folder of our choosing. 
Our main Windows drive is clearly identified by a Windows logo, but we can image any of the drives using this method. Our destination folder is typically an external drive, network drive, USB stick or memory card. We will return to this function shortly. Create an image of the partitions required to backup and restore Windows is almost identical but will only back up the Windows partitions, so would, for example, exclude a partition specifically set up to host only user-created files. Create a file and folder backup, disappointingly, is classified as a premium feature, and is therefore not available in the free version of the software. Nevertheless, this is an area where SyncBack excels, so we would very much encourage you to watch our SyncBack tutorial if your main aim is to back up specific collections of files and folders rather than a full disk partition. So here is our first backup scenario. We want to create a full system image of our C drive containing our Windows installation and all of the files and folders contained on it. Why would we do this? Well, we might be performing a clean installation of Windows as featured in our installing Windows tutorial series. Having a full system image allows us to perform an entirely clean installation of Windows with the safety net of a full system image stored elsewhere should we remember a file on the Erase system which we simply cannot live without. We might equally wish to simply back up a system which remains in use, purely to guard against accidental file deletion. We use the Image Selected Disks function, and note that our C drive is selected by default. We therefore click on Image This Disk. The output of this process is a single file, which will contain a full image of the drive. That image can be mounted as a virtual drive, and its content examined as though it were a physical disk. We therefore need to select a destination to store this file. The destination should ideally be a removable disk, which can be subsequently unplugged from the system and stored elsewhere. The destination also needs to be large enough to store data from the main drive. Although compression will shrink the storage requirement, it's always sensible to use a backup drive which has a capacity equal to the main drive. We will list some favourite external drives and USB sticks in the written description accompanying this video. We click to select the destination folder. The location selector appears. We have attached an external drive to the system, which Windows has labelled as E and named Backup. This is a blank drive assigned specifically for this purpose. We select the drive and click OK. We now see the E drive confirmed as the destination location so we now know that the content of our C drive will be saved as an image file to our E drive. With our options set, we click Next. Using the suggested compression option will reduce the size of the backup file. This is achieved by not including page file and hibernation files, which purely serve as a form of extended system memory and are most unlikely to be of any true value for archival purposes. We therefore accept the defaults and click OK to move onwards. As we are purely summarising, we won't explore scheduling options or retention rules in this tutorial. However, it should be noted that a selection of backup templates are provided should you wish to make use of them. We click Next once again. We are presented with a summary of the choices we have made, which will be applied to the backup, and we scroll down in order to review them fully. Having done so, we click Finish, which takes us to two further options. The first ensures that a backup will be run immediately, which we definitely want to do. The second allows us to save an XML definition file, which effectively captures the parameters of the backup for future use, and enables us to specify the save location for that definition file. We happily accept the default in both instances, and click OK. The backup process now begins. Dependent upon the volume of data being imaged, and the speed of the drives and processing system, this task may take some considerable time and you may wish to take a break as it progresses. We are presented with a summary of the backup task and advised that the image has been successfully created. We click OK to clear this dialog. What have we achieved? We have now created a single sizeable disk image on a removable disk. Within that image is the entire content of our C drive. Even if we fully erase our original C drive, we can now recover individual files from the saved image. Let's do that. Imagine that it is now some time later, and the content of our system has evolved significantly. We realise that we have deleted a single file saved in the old downloads folder, which we need to retrieve. We reconnect our backup drive, which the system labels E, and we rerun Macrium. 
This time we select Restore at the main menu and drop down to Explore Image, which we click. Here we see the image stored on our backup disk. We tick the small box next to the backup details and click OK. Our backup image now mounts as a virtual disk and is assigned a drive letter, in this case F. We can now browse this image as though it were a physical disk. We expand the window for ease of reference and click on the Users directory. Then we click on our TechF directory, where we find our Downloads folder, which we open. Inside, we find the Bookmarks export file, which we want to copy back to our main system. We can simply copy and paste this file as we would any other. Finally, let's consider a scenario where we wish to upgrade our hard drive, possibly to a larger capacity, without having to perform a clean installation of Windows. In this instance, we want to clone the disk. We therefore again physically attach the target drive to our system, select our system drive and click on clone this disk. In the dialog which appears, our system drive is already selected and our task is to select a disk to clone to. We select this option and select our attached external backup drive which is now confirmed as the destination for the backup. We click next. At the next screen, we click copy selected partitions which shows the source partition being copied to the destination. We won't cover partition options in this overview tutorial, but Macrium offers a greater degree of control over partitioning on the destination disk than is featured in this summary. We also take a brief detour to the advanced options, although novice users need not be concerned here. At this screen we choose between an intelligent sector copy, which will ignore sectors of the source file which are not in use and will therefore be faster, or forensic sector copy, which is slower but will replicate unused sectors. In most instances, accepting the default will be fine. Returning to the clone window, we again click next. As before, we will forego scheduling options in the name of brevity, but should you wish to replicate the cloning in future, note that this option is available. We simply click next here. The cloning operation is summarised and having checked the details, we click finish. As before, we have the option to run the backup immediately and to save an XML definition file. We accept the defaults and click OK to run the cloning procedure. Crucially, we are reminded that the cloning procedure will entirely overwrite the destination drive. Before clicking continue, check that this is what you want to do and that your destination disk contains nothing of value as it will be entirely erased. The cloning process begins with the progress bar again charting progress. As before, this is a potentially lengthy process and you may wish to take a break at this juncture. At the conclusion, we are advised that the process has been completed. Our backup drive is now a clone of the source drive and can be used in its place to boot into Windows. Thank you for watching this tutorial. Hopefully you found it useful. If you can provide a better, faster or more economical solution, let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like more, you are very welcome to subscribe to the Tech Fix Flicks YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. Subscription is of course entirely free and provides easy access to all of the videos posted here. Clicking on the neighbouring bell icon means you will be notified whenever a new video is posted. You can also keep in touch by following the official Tech Fix Flicks Twitter account. Until your next Tech Fix, goodbye.